to the Funnel Reboot Podcast with your host, Glenn Schmeltzley. Let's get into today's show. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot, a show for analytically minded marketers. I have a big welcome to you, no matter where you're coming from, because this is show number 175. Let's get straight into today's episode. I'm happy to say that this show covered a lot of books in 2023. 44% of this year's shows were with book authors. Combined with previous year's book episodes, we have now reached the 60 book mark on this podcast. I have no idea how we did that. If you want, you can sift through them all on the Funnel Reboot website by clicking on the books category on the right-hand menu. But these aren't the only books that I'm interested in. I've had the chance to read books outside of these, and I found even more that I really would like to feature here. Now, I'm not saying that all business books that come out are good. To be honest, a decent portion of them are pretty crappy. But since I set out once per year to make a special show, I felt it was time to review some of the business books that I don't think we should let slip by unnoticed. And after you hear the brief reviews I do of each of these six books, you'll hopefully put one or two of them on your to-be-read pile. So without further delay, let's get to the first author and book of this show. Soon Yu is a speaker and Forbes contributor and an authority on branding. He's formerly Global VP of Innovation at VF Corp, where he oversaw over 30 global apparel brands and he commercialized a $2 billion innovation pipeline. He's also had roles at Clorox and Shakita Brands. He is an MBA from Stanford University and is active with the Asian Alumni Association there. And he's also taught at the Parsons School of Design. We're talking here about his book, Friction. Now, we're told that we should remove friction from customer experience. Brands think that consumers want what's easy and convenient. Friction is bad. Well, if that's so, then ask yourself, why are IKEA products, with all the work they take to put together, such a popular phenomenon? Ask why the top-of-the-line Hermes product, the Birkin bag, isn't displayed on their store shelves. Instead, they're hidden away in the back room. If you ask to see a selection of Birkin bags, you're probably going to be fobbed off with, I don't know if we've got any in stock. And customers are usually told they'll have to spend at least the value of the bag on other Hermes products before being able to see the bags. Now, that's considerable friction to add to the already high-priced bag, because most of us don't need $2,000 bathroom slippers. And then, you might not even find a bag there. It may be in a design that you didn't want. And many customers return multiple times to see if a new bag becomes available, or so they can get themselves higher on a waiting list. It may feel as if Hermes is obstructive and disrespectful to their audience. But this friction makes their bags all the more coveted. Soon explains the role that our hormones play in the buying experience. He uses the Hermes bag example to explain how we like the thrill of the chase in seeking solutions for our needs and wants, and how we derive good vibes once we find them. We have to acknowledge how buying Birkin bags and similar experiences releases dopamine, serotonin, and adrenaline. The psychology of these higher price goods doesn't set us up to be as satisfied as we'd be buying a budget product. Due to the hormone release, it actually makes us more satisfied. The point is that many things we buy are a statement of meaning for us. It's not purely ephemeral. So buyers will feel strongly connected to brands that involve friction and demonstrate that they think about the past 
and the present and the future, because that's the long-term meaning that their buyer activities seek to fill. Friction also applies to pricing. The Economist magazine did an experiment with their subscription models. They offered three options, and 84% of people chose the last and highest option. None of them chose the middle, mid-tier option. Then the researchers removed that middle option. The results changed dramatically. This time, 68% of the subjects chose the first option, which was the lower priced. Why this happens is that the middle option was really a decoy. It made little sense because it was a lot like the high-priced option, but it had a massive impact on people's psychological decision-making. It gave them more data to work with, more to consider. That's friction that they use as context for a decision. So think about the outcome you want before you remove friction from something like pricing. Soon says that you can use social media influencers, especially ones who have an expertise that relates to your brand. But watch how you use friction here. The most important trait that they or someone else who owns the desired brand is that they cannot be too high above your buyer. That's why we resent seeing certain people in our Instagram feed. Watching those influencers erodes our self-esteem. I'm looking at you, Kardashian wannabes. What you should do to close the gap is make them people that your buyer can relate with and give away small items like wristbands and badges and bumper stickers. Those foster an emotion of belonging to your brand. You can introduce friction through telling your backstory. People love being behind the scenes. Make sure to involve your audience in the telling and retelling of your brand story. Provide opportunities for them to learn nitty-gritty details, facts, recognize them, reward them for this effort. The small amount of effort that it takes for them to hear it and recount it to others increases desirability. It amplifies the dopamine boost of anticipation that they experience. Provide opportunities for your audience to learn these details and facts. That will be its own reward. Lastly, he says, don't confuse conversation with broadcast and confusing being personal with personalization. Having a personal conversation requires an investment of time from both sides. So do include live conversations, either offline or online, that have plenty of time for unscripted moments of listening and reacting. This fosters strong affinity because it is full of friction. To sum up, Soon says that you should try to remove bad friction from your experience, but embrace the good friction. David Premier holds a master's degree in chemistry and was an award-winning science researcher. But why we're talking about him is because of his work in sales. He consults with businesses through his company, Cerebral Selling, showing unique science and empathy-based approaches. He's also an adjunct lecturer. He's also an adjunct lecturer at both Queen's University and London Business School and his articles about sales have run in many publications. The role that was pivotal to his time in sales that led him on this journey was being VP of commercial sales at Salesforce, where he was responsible for the small business segment for the Eastern U.S. He managed 70 sales reps spread across three cities, and they all had year-end quotas on their revenue goals. He was there to help them ride that emotional roller coaster. In the critical final days before year end, he was there to keep the reps who hadn't hit their quota calm and focused on the company's goals in the hopes that they would make up for lost ground. These reps executed with intensity and speed, reaching out to customers on all channels 
exploring every revenue opportunity they could. Make the calls, make the calls, was frequently heard on the sales floor. And as year end got close, revenues looked like they'd exceed expectations. But there was a problem. David noticed that this sales hustle and high frequency outreach that he pushed was happening elsewhere too. He himself was the prime target for all kinds of business solutions, and he found himself on the receiving end of those very same tactics. But the more that the phone rang and that his email and LinkedIn account lit up, the less reachable he became. He wouldn't answer his phone or reply to those emails. They were doing the same things, though, that his data points told him were what you were supposed to do to achieve high quotas. But it just wasn't working. And that's when he decided to look at this differently and to write the book, Sell the Way You Buy, which I'm going to talk about here. Now, obviously, we as sellers want to align our actions with experiences that buyers like to have. But David has concluded that many tactics would never work on us if we were on the buying side of a transaction. And that's why it's even harder for sellers, because they can't just ask customers what messages would work on them. Customers really don't know themselves, or they are too shielded in skepticism. His book examines a few functional areas of sales, and it looks at these things using a scientific view of what works and doesn't work. One thing I like is the attention value matrix he uses. It focuses on the degrees to which buyers notice sellers, and it doesn't treat all categories the same. There are some that have a low value and require high attention, An example of that is pencils, and he puts those in a category called the sea of sameness. There's the things that have high perceived value, and they need low attention to hook buyers. Think iPhone. There's the unlucky virtuous that still require an excessive amount of effort to break through customers' defenses, even though they're really good. For this category, think oat bran fiber, daily exercise. And then there's the innovative minority, the just right Goldilocks combination of a good value proposition and a high impact delivery mechanism. Organizations in this innovative minority have figured out how to cut through the noise. They've managed to get buyers to disproportionately notice their products and services with a minimum of hoopla. So it's really important to understand how your product is positioned and which one of those it falls under. Another thing David wants us to focus on is problems, not solutions. You heard me right. When a company declares its beliefs about a problem, what the prospect hears is the company has made it their mission to solving their problem. And they can't help but feel the company is aligned with them making them receptive to their products. If you want a quick litmus test to determine whether or not you're on the right track, ask yourself if a typical member of your target audience would do that when they hear your belief statement. And if the answer is no, there's more work to be done. He says you have to help people notice that you have even a Band-Aid solution, something that's going to fix a problem they're having right now. But what if they don't know that they're cut and need a Band-Aid? The answer is, cut them. Well, what he means is you should clearly convey the problem that you solve before communicating how you solve it. Take time on messages that are striking and laden with specific and compelling statistics. Invoke real business pains. Make the customer realize they're already experiencing a loss. In other words, show them they're bleeding. That's when they'll realize they need a Band-Aid. In the book, he gives a ladder of questions that's helpful 
in dwelling on this problem. For example, customer, can you tell me about your problem using a story that exemplifies it? How long have you been experiencing this problem? What have you tried to do in order to solve this problem? And why didn't that solution work out? David also offers some pretty helpful things around language. One gem from him is that you shouldn't end an explanation with, does that make sense? Here's one typical example. Quote, one of the things our clients love about our solution is the way our unique three-layer security algorithm proactively identifies orthogonal threats to your network before they can cause harm. Does that make sense? As you probably heard, that puts a client in an awkward word trap. As David says, that phrase can be interpreted in negative ways. It could be seen as an insult to the customer's intelligence. Like you're asking because you're not quite sure how smart the person is. And so you're afraid that this concept, no, no matter how intuitive it may seem, simply isn't something their puny little brain can understand. Or it can also imply that the seller just isn't good as it, at explaining things. It could be, I'm not very good at using my words, and I often leave people confused and bewildered, and I didn't want to make sure I did that to you. Neither of those are good, so just don't use the phrase, does that make sense? So if you're a seller or an entrepreneur or a leader, you should look at the natural and very human focus that David brings to sales in this book. I think you'll like how it shows ways to deeply connect with customers and communicate the value of our products. Reed Hoffman is one of the original PayPal mafia. He co-founded professional networking site LinkedIn in 2003, and he sold LinkedIn to Microsoft for $26 billion in 2016. And he's now a partner at the VC firm Greylock Partners. Reed has a master's from Oxford and a bachelor's from Stanford. And he also became one of OpenAI's initial funders. But I think a very interesting fact about him is that he's also put over one and a half billion of his own dollars into impact investments with companies whose stated mission is to improve the world around us. Today, we're talking about his book, Impromptu. This book was written after OpenAI's chat GPT-3 was publicly released at the end of 2022. Being an OpenAI insider, Reed felt he needed to help people learn about this new tool. Our track record with seeing the transformative power of new technology is really bad, according to Reed. One mistake we make is that we, quote, plug them in as a substitute for an existing technology. But seldom is the new technology an exact analog for what came before. When the internet first appeared, great services like Yahoo resembled online phone books. We discovered over time that the better approach was to give it a search engine approach. We're still at the online phone book stage of LLMs he says. To see what GPT's capabilities were, we decided to use it to co-write a book. So the book is largely a transcript of prompts he gives GPT and their resulting conversations. This dialogue format, of course, dates back to Plato's days. They're an effective medium for teasing out truths. And Reed obviously reads a wide range of fields. His style is kind of like that British historian, James Burke. And that's what makes his dialogues with GPT more interesting than most of our GPT interactions. This makes you want to keep on reading. His first few questions demonstrate the differences compared to a search engine. Even though search engines take information from billions of individual web pages, the quality of a search result is only as good as the information that it found on a single web page. 
LLMs aren't hemmed in by web pages. All that siloed information is taken out and mashed all together. And that's why GPT was easily able to answer questions he asked like, who is the tallest NFL running back to win the MVP award? What cities with more than 1 million residents have had female mayors? And who was the oldest James Bond? Search engines would stumble with the, but it's a cinch for GPT to answer them. This is just one of the use cases that it can serve. But GPT won't tell us it can do these things. We have to come up with the ideas. Here are some of the controversial prompts and responses in the book. How will GPT disrupt our workforce? It says in the book that some workers' jobs are ripe for disrupting. Quote, management consultants who are unable to add value beyond standardized activities will suffer. A firm can't pay young analysts to turn the crank and then charge the client 10 times their salary for such output. Management consultants who can take the time that AI frees up and focus instead on generating unconventional insights could devote more of their time to this high-value activity and deliver even better service to their clients using the help of AI. Here's another. How do we handle AI's ability to make misinformation? Quote, the problem with fake news is not just fake news. It's that so many people want fake news because it supports what they already believe to be true, unquote. He says the solution is to create a culture of transparency and accountability around information, such as showing the ingredients of news articles so that you can easily fact check the sources just as you do the nutrition label on a can of soup. How do we handle AI hallucinations? Well, this is a new wrinkle on an old problem. The problem that ideas conceived in the human brain change when conveyed through our writing. Writing is imperfect, but that doesn't mean we don't put stock in printed books or Wikipedia. We will need guardrails on this, but implementing it for GPT will need to be faster than we had for cars or for pharmaceutical recalls. Also, the standard is now lower because the information that GPT's put out just has to be good enough for our standards. For example, for writing a college essay. What can AI and humans do when they work together? Reed created a bot fashioned after Alan Turing and asked it to answer in the legendary computer designer's style. And he asked it to explain interactions between human intelligence and GPT intelligence. It replied, quote, My scientific dialogues are the product of my genius and creativity, while AI's responses are the product of your genius and creativity. And he's referring, of course, to the fact that GPT is scraping humankind's body of knowledge that we've made available on the internet. I thought that was a good way of putting it. To sum up, Reed's opinion of AI isn't all good or all bad. This is why it would misrepresent him if I just cherry-picked a few excerpts of the book. So to get his nuanced view, I would encourage you to really read the entirety of his book. And it's available for free. He admits that LLMs have the potential to turn civilization into either a utopic or a dystopic algocracy. But the fact is, LLMs will require less and less from us as they improve. To prevent them from becoming our overlords, he says we have to demand more and more from ourselves. In the end, it's up to us. Tim Wu is a lawyer, professor, and writer. He has degrees from McGill as well as from Harvard Law School. Twenty years ago, studying the effects of 
private power by major tech platforms, he coined the term net neutrality. He's been a professor at Columbia Law School since 2006, and he's also run for public office and regularly contributed articles to the New York Times. In 2021, he became the White House's special assistant for technology and competition policy. We're going to focus on his book, The Attention Merchants. We live in a world with pervasive advertising. But how did we get here? Tim gives us a history of media, from early print periodicals to posters and billboards to radio to TV and to the internet. He shows that with every new media, a fork in the road moment arrives when the media infrastructure or the production costs become so great, they must reach out to someone else who will pay for it. The two groups that they can charge are either those who consume the media or decide to sell the audience's attention to advertisers. Almost without exception, they choose the latter. He cites Wikipedia as one of those entities that zigged instead of zagging. The book says that the founder, Jimmy Wales, thought of Wikipedia like a library or a school. In the words of the book, when Wikipedia came to its own fork in the road, gaining enough traffic to rival or exceed that of nearly any other site except for the search engines, it chose the other path, deciding to remain free of advertising. It effectively forsook billions in potential revenue. This is something I keep in mind when I see those pleas for donations in Wikipedia's pages. A large chunk of the book shows the ways this money for eyeballs exchange involving publishers slash media platforms has worked over the years. They have gotten insanely good at it, too. The result is that we are Quote, perpetually distracted. We spend too much time on social media or watching television and consequently consume more advertising than could ever serve our own useful purposes. So, does our world need marketing? Wu says yes, arguing it fulfills a vital function by addressing a gap in classical economic models. He says, we humans aren't just zombies following the laws of supply and demand. That's not how we find or consume products. Whether it's a film, a novel, or a utility product, discovering valuable offerings requires attention. In an information-rich world, awareness is essential. One cannot demand or purchase something they aren't aware of. In the opposite cold, choiceless world, if a price fell in the market and no one heard it, it wouldn't make a sound. So how does he think this constant tension can be solved? He starts off the book by putting it this way, quote, it is we who have voluntarily or somewhat voluntarily entered into this grand bargain with the attentional industry, and we enjoy the benefits, but it's essential that we fully understand the deal. Certainly, some of our daily attentional barters for news, good entertainment, or useful services are good deals, but others are not. The real purpose of this book is less to persuade you one way or the other, but to get you to see the terms plainly. And seeing them plainly demand bargains that reflect the life you want to live. History also reveals that we are hardly powerless in our dealings with these guys. Advertisers aren't all villains, and we aren't all good. But individually, we have the power to ignore, tune them out, and unplug from them. He quotes Oxford philosopher James William, who says, Your goals are things like spend more time with the kids, or learn to play the zither, lose 20 pounds by summer, finish your degree, etc. Your time is scarce, and you know it. Your technologies, on the other hand, are trying to maximize goals like time on site, number of video views, page views, and so on. Hence, clickbait. Hence, autoplaying videos. Hence, avalanches of notifications. 
your time is scarce, and your technologies know it, unquote. So Wu ends the book by repeating, if we desire a future that avoids the enslavement of the propaganda state, as well as the narcosis of the consumer and celebrity culture, we must first acknowledge the preciousness of our attention and resolve not to part with it as cheaply or as unthinkingly as we so often have. John Jantz is a keynote speaker, a husband, father of four grown children, and is a native Missourian. As he consulted for small businesses when he was younger, he became known for his pragmatic approach, something that many Midwesterners are known for. The name of his 2000 book, Duct Tape Marketing, embodies it. And since it came out, this philosophy has become what he calls his consultancy. Duct Tape Marketing now trains marketers and agencies on his methodology for how to do marketing. He is also host of the Duct Tape Marketing Podcast, which has put out almost 980 episodes to date. And he's the best selling author of seven books, which have combined sales of over 150,000 copies. I'd like to tell you today about his book, The Self Reliant Entrepreneur. First, let's talk about its format. The book is broken up by days of the year, each day. From January to 1 to December 31 has a page devoted to it. Every entry starts with a quote taken from authors associated with the 19th century American transcendentalist movement. If you don't know who they were, they were a group of writers that included Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, Louisa May Alcott, Orestes Brownson, William Ellery Channing, William Henry Channing, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, and Walt Whitman. So after it has that passage, there is a personal commentary by John that connects the readings to current day challenges. And then it ends with a question to meditatively reflect on. Transcendentalists held that society can corrupt individual spirituality, and that's why they advocated for genuine self-reliance. A typical quote that embodies this would be, our real joy is ultimately defined by what we willingly struggle for. The transcendentalists believed that true community comes out of very independent individuals. Additionally, they really valued nature, not just its aesthetics, but also its structure. They said that it provides us with observations about our own inner workings to better understand our inner selves. One quote I love, it's easy to conclude that doing what others do or think you should do is some sort of giving in, but self-reliance means you get to decide and for that matter, define what is and isn't conformity. That, by the way, was taken from the book's entry on May 4th. Now, some of us may not have read these authors since being in school, so it's good to revisit them. And there are others here who have worthwhile things to say because you wouldn't even otherwise hear about them. That's another good reason why this book exists. The other books of John's that I have read are all very practical marketing guides. But this one comes from a totally different part of him, the one that struggled with all the decisions and responsibilities that he had running his business. Clearly, he found that reading these passages was helpful, and he's chosen to share them with others. I bought this book in late 2022 because it had the word entrepreneur in its title. Now, while I'd been an entrepreneur for a decade, I was still weighed down by the same things as John, and I felt I should be better at dealing with them. By reading this book bit by bit each morning through 2023, it definitely wired my brain with appreciation and some coping skills for what I do. And the best I can sum it up with that I would hope you think of as you 
consider getting this book is don't wish it was easier. Wish that you were better. That's why I think this is a good book for entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs, and practically all of us, anyone who wants to be a better version of themselves and will be willing to spend a few minutes of their day working on that. Born in London, on graduating high school, Mustafa Suleiman got into Oxford University, but he dropped out to establish a youth helpline that ended up being one of the UK's largest mental health support services for Muslims. He served as a human rights policy officer for the Mayor of London. He founded Rayos Partners, co-founded DeepMind Technologies, which was acquired by Google in 2014, then went to Google and became head of their applied AI, playing a key role in the drafting of an AI charter there. He is now the CEO of Inflection AI, which is in league with the foremost generative AI companies out there. So when he, of all people, titles his book, The Coming Wave, Technology, Power, and the 21st Century's Greatest Dilemma, we should talk about it. Picture a future where we don't suffer from want. All our needs are met. We live long lives, and any illnesses we get are treatable. We don't work just for a paycheck, but we get to choose work that compensates us well and that we find meaningful. Because we have personal intelligence assistance around, we even choose whether we delegate tasks that we dislike to them or whether they can help us think through the work that we're doing. Now, picture another future that's made up of the worst portrayals that we see in Terminator, Gattaca, Star Trek's Borg, The Matrix, Westworld, or any other Hollywood interpretations of the danger AI can pose. Take superintelligence, combine it with robotics and synthetic biology, and you have something that could destroy the world. According to Mustafa Suleiman, both of these futures that I've described may end up happening. Now, to be specific, it's not so much that AI goes rogue. The simpler, likelier threat that we face is humans using AI for evil ends. With our society so dependent on technology that an individual or a small group with AI could really mess things up on a big scale. Mustafa says, quote, if the last wave reduced the costs of broadcasting information, this one reduces the costs of acting on it, giving rise to technologies that go from sequencing to synthesis, reading to writing, editing to creating, imitating conversations to leading them. And he also says, quote, with the coming wave, forces will go beyond the internet and the digital sphere. But however it happens, this could be the end of our species Homo technologicus. Reed Hoffman actually used Homo techne, a nearly identical term. Either way, it could be that our species brings about its own destruction. Might sound like hyperbole, but it's hard when you're talking about such landmark technologies to not sound like you're exaggerating. The pushback that he got when he talked about this to many people was that technology is neither good or bad. It's value neutral. He says you can't be so meek with this powerful a technology. He calls it instead omni-use, characterizing it as able to be simultaneously awesome and terrifying. Quote, being blinkered about what is happening is, in my view, worse than being overly speculative which is how parts of the book read. Let's look at some examples of how far this intelligence can go beyond ours. We all know that LLMs are trained by reading internet content. What it has taken GBT3 a few hours to read 
ends up being many, many orders of magnitude above what what the most prolific human reader could read, even if they spent their entire lifetime reading. I just hadn't appreciated how much difference there is between humans and AI there. Now, apply that thinking without any sense of ethics to a game called Universal Paperclips. This is a real simulation you can go check out. It starts off by creating one paperclip at a time. The AI can sell paperclips to create money to finance automated machines that make more paperclips. And on the AI goes. You get resources to make paperclips that you sell to buy more resources. It pursues this mission unswervingly. And in the simulation, it eventually marshals all dead and living mass in the universe for this unitary purpose. So knowing that AI can be like this, how should one respond to this threat? Well, acknowledging its dangers and trying to contain it, which means putting some separation between the tool and the people that it impacts. We're mindful that attempts to completely contain previous technology waves all failed. They propagated regardless. So we clearly have containment challenges that also apply to this new wave. One twist, the self-improving element of AI. It means sooner or later it will move itself outside of the enclosures we have in it. Guardrails would either be too simple for it, and it'll just outmaneuver, or it could be remade in a quantum computer that would blow by our ordinary silicon computer restrictions. AIs can create other AIs too and talk with them, inventing languages to talk to each other without us understanding what they're saying. These things will happen while other experts are accomplishing great things. That's part of the paradox here. Quote, AI's technologies are largely beyond our ability to comprehend at a granular level, yet still within our ability to create and use. Unquote. What makes our society able to adapt to this and also to be hurt by it is our fragile nature. The sad fact is, AI exploits this. It's, in his words, a fragility amplifier. An example of this is our encounters with deepfakes. The issue that some of us believe them isn't the only problem. It's that this amplification can overwhelm us all. None of us will know what to believe. Causes a self-fulfilling prophecy because when citizens' lives are disrupted by AI, especially with news around government, it erodes their faith in government. And government's number one job is to protect people. And in the circle we go. So it's inevitable that we will all feel the effects of AI. According to him, democratizing access to AI necessarily means democratizing risk. This will also be deeply felt in private industry. He sees AI bringing upheaval to the economy, like Schopenhauer's creative destruction, but on steroids. It's going to take an hour of someone's time, which used to be our economic input, and replace it with machines whose main input is data and whose output is human-like intelligence. Giant tech corporations are racing to do this, but at the same time, they're claiming to step in on behalf of their youth and workers, even though their inventions will displace many. They assure us they can act in our best interest as governing states, just the way that organized religion or societies used to do. At one point, he says about these Silicon Valley giants, quote, there is an unbridgeable gulf between their desire to reign in the coming wave and the desire to shape and own it. Now, funnily enough, the fact that AI hardware and code is currently concentrated in the hands of a few players gives us a choke point, he says, to monitor and temper what they're doing. That actually could buy us some time and give us an indication of where to look to spot problems. Which brings us to regulatory reaction. 
He tells the story of a few years ago how Ring Doorbell put live feeds of suburban streets into a private company's hands almost overnight with a relatively inexpensive piece of hardware and an internet connection. And he told that story to show how regulators just aren't structured to handle this technology. At best, regulatory and legal systems can react to what's happened and let cases set precedents for rulemaking. You just can't hem it in by naming a department in charge of it. I mean, the scope of general purpose AI, it can be equal to all of government. This is why Mustafa predicts that democratic nations could be weakened by AI's runaway usage, since its unchecked growth can neutralize their ability. Quote, technology is ultimately political because technology is a form of power. Some will use AI to tighten their grip on people. Others won't be able to keep up with fragment groups who, with some AI, provide themselves with everything that they used to rely on government for. Quote, the disenfranchised will re-enfranchise themselves on their own terms. Unquote. So the most likely outcome is either autocratic dystopia or the catastrophic disintegration of government. Great choices. The failure, though, is not a flaw with the idea of government, he says. It's an assessment of the scale of the challenge before us. And he hopes that we can steer AI in that narrow passage between those two. What are the solutions? Though governments are sometimes slow or uninterested in regulating it, they're in this race. They may try old-style containment, but that'll stop both the bad and the good use of the tool with an all-out kill switch. But there is work in the public realm that is showing some promising ideas. The EU's AI law is currently being implemented. It already actually has some of Mustafa's policy recommendations in it. He suggests something like an International Atomic Energy Committee forcing even enemies to work together on this. Clever policies can force countries to transparently report the R&D they're doing on AI. Keeps everyone honest. Another one is mandate that labs doing this carry costly insurance. Boring mechanisms like these could hem in those who work with these tools, curbing their most fanatical ideas, causing them to think twice before deploying something on the internet. The engineers behind AI want to be accountable for what they built. He doesn't see them wanting to escape accountability by saying that their tech is just out of control. In fact, he thinks all of us can be part of the response to this. He points to abolition, public education, giving rights to women and minorities, banning chemical weapons, eradicating diseases. These were all grassroots movements. And we aren't helpless if each of us works from our own sphere of influence. This work to contain the wave and safeguard our society will never be finished. He says, safe, contained technology is like liberal democracy. It's not a final end state. Rather, it's an ongoing process, a deliberate equilibrium that must be actively maintained, constantly fought for and protected. I imagine containment as a narrow and treacherous path, unquote. So that's the coming wave. And while it has such sweeping scope that fills nearly 300 pages with lots of doomsday scenarios in them, it's still a book I really recommend. Thanks so much for listening. I've put links to all the books in the show notes in the hope that you'll go read one or get your hands on something else. There are so many good reads out there. If you commit to reading an average of 10 books per year over the course of a few years, that can reach 66 books, the very number that have been on the podcast so far. Extend it over a few decades and it can turn into 300, 400, or even 500 books. It's staggering. So think of the cumulative effect these can have on sculpting your mind so you can have better insights. 
which makes you an even better you. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.